nice. This traffic is loud. Everything is a little quieter. Sever told me that you you have been uh, the director of the um, uh, Istanbul Modern also. Mm -hmm. Um, how long have you been there? I wasn't there very long, but uh, uh, before that I was running the, and set up the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo. Um, I was there for five years, and before that I was in Stockholm as director of Moderna Mosaic. And I opened Raphael Monet's new building there in 1989, and I was there for five years. So, uh, at the moment I'm living in Berlin. So now you are um, the artistic director of the Sydney Biennial. Mm -hmm. um, could you uh, tell us a little bit about um, how did you get the, this job and um, what's your connection with Sydney? And um... oh. Well, I have no connection with Sydney other than I've been there a few times and uh, I was asked to present some ideas for them. And uh, I did so and they, they, they liked them. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's how that happened. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the concept, hmm. um, what, the ideas? Sure. You well, the title of the Biennale is, is The Beauty of Distance, Songs of Survival in a Precarious Age. And I wanted to make a, a, a show, which I think a Biennale is. I don't think Biennale is a, really essentially that much different from any other big exhibition of contemporary art. I wanted to make a show that, that actually uh, spoke to the situation in Sydney, in Australia, in the Asian Pacific region, but also would have uh, a much greater relevance to what is happening in art now, the condition of contemporary art today. And it seemed to me that distance was rather a good subject because it has several connotations, has several meanings. One is that uh, distance uh, uh, is, is one of the things that relates to uh, ourselves. We need a critical distance before we can make up our minds about things. There's a distance between how we really are and how we present ourselves to the outside world. Um, in art, uh, there's a distance between what an artist produces, creates, and then all the experiences and emotions that feed into that. Um, and that particular distance we call aesthetics. And within that whole area of aesthetics, we decide somehow whether something's good or not. And there's not only one idea of quality, there are number, maybe a number of ideas of quality that go across cultures. And I think that it's very important now, uh, when we talk about distance having shrunk so much in terms of mass travel, internet communication, real-time communication across the world, that, um, that we actually look at the distance between cultures. And how do we... Uh, how do we make uh, assessments? How do we make uh, judgments about how some things are better than others? And very often these are on very arbitrary basis. It's uh, uh, maybe on what we know uh, rather than what we don't know. Of course, things you don't know, you, you can't uh, make a judgment about. But uh, now that information is running so much more freely, there's no excuse. Uh, and people are traveling so much more, there's no excuse. Except still, the art world is uh, uh, much more uh, global than it was, but it's still uh, really focusing around a very crude market value idea of what is, uh, what is worthwhile in art, rather than there being any serious aesthetic discussion of what's going on. And uh, I guess after having been dominated for so long by uh, Western Europe and uh, and North America, the whole kind of aesthetic agenda of contemporary art. Uh, it takes a little while before the people who've had so much power, they're certainly not going to give it up, but they'll die off and the people will grow up who actually have a much broader view, a uh, much more open-minded view of what quality is and what quality may be uh, in art. So it's about this, uh, this idea of distance. And I think in the Australian context, I mean, having been a penal colony, uh, so where uh, discovered first out of the spirit of the Euro European Enlightenment, Thomas Cook went there, he collected things, he collected uh, plant specimens, specimens, bits of people, he sent bits of people back. And it was part of this grand encyclopedic project that all knowledge could be known and possessed.
Uh, and um, really this project, I think, has come to an end now. Uh, that we, we realize that, uh, that knowledge can't always be categorized rigidly. That in fact, uh, uh, one, one field of knowledge has to spread out into another. And that it's actually a, uh, an extremely, uh, uh, I would go so far as to say, fascistic way of looking at the world. But everything has to be in its category. Um, because, of course, things spread over many categories. And uh, there are many different perspectives and viewpoints on, singular, on single issues, on single questions. Uh, artists have known this for a long time. Uh, scientists, I mean, theoretical scientists, physicists, anyone involved in, uh, in pure mathematics or in astrophysics certainly knows this and is looking for uh, you know, grand unified theory, uh, haven't found it yet, in which uh, the various, various theories by which we structure the world come into a kind of unity. And I actually believe that we're in not such a distant state at the moment in art uh, when we're looking and talking about art in terms of how it is manifested across the whole of the world in different cultures.